a perpetual traveler through the Bible, please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. The book of Revelation is a record of God's solution to the crisis of creation that is under the dominion of sin. It is also a record of how He will bring about the long-promised world of peace and blessing. Revelation is not a Hollywood movie script where God comes to wipe out the bad guys and to punish all sinners with spectacular special effects. After thousands of years of patient waiting and putting up with mankind's arrogance, hate, greed and the bloodshed that has plagued our earth so long, God has declared that there comes a time when He will say, enough is enough, and bring an end to the whole problem. Just before his crucifixion, as Jesus talked with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, he told them what would happen in the period just before his second coming. In that passage in Matthew 24, he refers several times to what he calls the end of the age. This is the same final seven-year period that the prophet Daniel speaks about in Daniel chapter 9, when he speaks about a period of 70 weeks of years. This seven-year period of both Daniel and Jesus' prophecy contains the fascinating and frightening series of events that we are currently exploring in Revelation chapters 6 through to 19. If you read about the life of Christ in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will notice that almost one-third of the entire Gospel story is focused on a single seven-day period, the week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. Thirteen of Revelation's 22 chapters are focused on a single seven-year week of time, a period which comprises the end of the history of this age. This seven-year week is characterized by three series of events. Firstly, the seven seals. Secondly, the seven trumpets. And thirdly, the seven bowls of wrath. First of all, in chapter 6, we saw that final seven-year period unfolding its first cycle as a seven-sealed scroll. A scroll that, as each seal is broken, is ultimately opened and revealed. The seals describe events like false peace, war, famine, disease, death, and the collapse of the sky when the sixth seal is broken. We saw terrified men crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. The sixth seal then introduced us to that period known as the Day of the Lord, that final outpouring of the wrath from the hand of God. The breaking of the seventh seal starts the next cycle of the seven trumpets that are covered in chapters 8 and 9. After the first trumpet sounds, Christ casts a fire-filled censer to earth, which produces thunders and lightnings, an earthquake, and hail and fire mixed with blood, and destroys a third of the earth's vegetation. The second trumpet blows, and a third of the sea is destroyed by a flaming mountain that falls out of the sky into the sea. The third trumpet blows and a star called Wormwood poisons a third of the fresh water. The fourth trumpet blows and a third of the stars and the moon and the sun are darkened and the chaos in the heavens and earth escalates. When the fifth trumpet blows, all hell is turned loose to torment men. Demons that have been bound in the abyss are free to run over the earth, inflicting pain on human beings. Then the sixth trumpet blows and a third of the inhabitants of earth are killed by fire and smoke and sulphur. When the seventh trumpet blows, it announces the final seven bowls of wrath that we will get into in chapter 16. This will be the time when the great question of all the martyrs of all the ages is finally answered, which is, How long, O Lord, how long? We come now to the final series of judgments from God in chapters 15 and 16, and we start with chapter 15 verses 1 to 4. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. 
The first thing to notice here is that God promises that this is the last of the series of judgments. A turning point of history has been reached with the seven bowls of God's wrath. God will then begin to set up his kingdom upon the earth. John describes a great host of martyrs, men and women who have given up their lives under the Antichrist, which is the beast of chapter 13, and they are now seen in heaven standing on the sea of glass or crystal. We saw the sea of glass in chapter 4, and there we understood it to be the symbol of the spirit of holiness, especially of the righteous holiness which the Spirit imparts to those who come to Christ. This is the only basis for man to be allowed to appear before the presence of God. This characteristic also ties in with the whole armor of God which is described in Ephesians chapter 6. There the Apostle Paul tells us to stand with the breastplate of righteousness in place. It is Christ's righteousness, not ours, that we have on to protect our heart. Here the sea is described as mingled with fire, because it is a holiness that appears in the midst of persecution. Fire signifies purification through tempering or testing. These martyrs are said to have conquered the beast. In the world's eyes, they are losers. They were captured, imprisoned, reviled, hated. Some were even tortured. Then they were put to death, all for the crime of confessing Jesus as Lord. They are powerless, stripped of everything, even life itself. Yet upon their arrival in heaven, they are crowned as victors. Perhaps the most common defect we have as human beings is our stubborn insistence that our perceptions and our illusions are the true reality. No matter how hopelessly wrong we are, we always insist that we are right. The Antichrist thinks he is getting rid of his enemies down here, but what he is really doing is being used by God to get believers to heaven. He does not realize that God is using him for the very purposes that he was ordained. This host of martyrs sing two songs. They sing the song of Moses, which is recorded in Exodus 15 as the Israelites came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, and the song that I have just read, the song of the Lamb in Revelation 15. These songs are the first and last songs that are specifically described in Scripture. Both of these songs describe the deliverance of God's people by divine power. Both center on redemption through blood. When Moses and the Israelites sang the song of Moses, they were looking back to the blood of the Lamb that was applied over the lintels of the doorposts to keep them safe when the angel of death passed through the land of Egypt. Here, in the song of the Lamb, the martyrs are praising God and honoring Him for the divine power that has delivered them from the wrath of the Antichrist, based on the blood of redemption shed by the Lamb of God. In the Song of the Lamb there is not one single word about their own achievements. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. The martyrs do not ever sing, O Lord, how faithful we have been to you. How true we have been to your word. How steadfastly we have endured. The only pronouns used in the song are your and you. What this song should teach us is that when we stand in the presence of God, we will not feel that we have done anything. We will simply be grateful, grateful beyond words for what God has done for us. From verse 5 to the end of this brief chapter, the seven angels proceed to the final judgment. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure white linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives for ever and ever, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. This scene is very much like the one that Isaiah 6 verses 1 describes. That verse says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. John sees the great temple in the heaven open, and the seven angels come out of the Holy of Holies, bearing the seven bowls of the wrath of God. We are told in verse 8 that this smoke symbolizes the powerful glory of God. 
It is smoke from the glory of God and from His power. The smoke fills the great temple of heaven so that no one can enter until the work of the angels is completed. Again, this is symbolic. But what does it mean? It means that it is too late to pray. By faith and by prayer we can enter into the presence of God in His temple, but here it has become impossible. The time has come when man can no longer repent. It is too late to pray when this final judgment scene begins. In chapter 16, the seven angels will pour out their bowls in rapid succession. It is a terrible time of judgment, the most intensive time of tribulation the world has ever seen. This time is what several of the Old Testament prophets call the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is what Jesus referred to in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 when he said, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. Notice how Jesus says, No human being, all the population of the world, would have been destroyed. This great and terrible day of the Lord is a brief, intense period that comes at the end of the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. When we go through this passage during the next podcast, you will notice that it covers the same areas of judgment as the seals and the trumpets do. In other words, it is an intensifying of the judgment of the seals and the trumpets which we have already seen. This is taking us to the brink of final judgment. Chapter 16 will begin with the words, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. That is inevitable. Once God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ because of what he was doing for sinners. In the future, the wrath of God will be poured out on sinners because of what they are doing to Jesus Christ. God is not willing that anyone should perish. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and Jesus himself wept over lost souls. Romans 9 verses 22 to 23 says, God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So in wrath God remembers mercy but when mercy is refused it brings judgment. Remember this final judgment does not happen until the world has been warned and warned again in every imaginable conceivable way. By this time in Revelation, the inhabitants of the earth have had seven years of unceasing judgment. The sky has collapsed. The earth has been shaken. Death and devastation is felt and experienced across the globe. The seas have been devastated. The fresh water has been devastated. And the vegetation has been devastated. Tidal waves have engulfed the land. Comets and meteorites have been flying out of the sky and bombarding the earth. Destroying demons have been released out of the abyss. People will be killing one another. People will be struck with diseases from which they cannot die, but wish to die. And all of this will be going on for a long time. At that same time, the gospel will be continually preached, and anyone who gets to this point and still refuses mercy will have made their choice against all offers of mercy. So in wrath, God does remember mercy. But mercy, if refused, leaves God no choice. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 47.